Welcome to season two of the Wonder and Wonder podcast. This is where Think Learning Studio co-hosts Russell Cayley and Christian Long sit down with educational visionaries from around the world to explore ways to foster genuine learning. While every guest takes us in new directions, we are genuinely drawn to the human-centered innovators mindset that all of our guests share. We hope you'll discover a range of inspiring strategies and stories about how empathy, curiosity, play and creativity help shape the future of learning, a future where every person thrives. We also hope you'll share the podcast and invite others to come along for the ride. Season two, episode eight of the podcast has us talking with Seth Goldenberg. He's the founder and CEO of two interrelated organizations, Epic Decade, a venture-based design studio, and Curiosity & Co, an imagination company designing flourishing futures with a wide array of Fortune 500 firms, not-for-profits, and creative collectives. Seth just published his first book, Radical Curiosity, Questioning Commonly Held Beliefs to Imagine Flourishing Futures. This book is also the first formal publishing imprint collaboration released between his team and Penguin Random House. In a previous life, Seth served as Vice President and Director of Massive Change within the internationally celebrated Bruce Mao Studio. Seth also once was the founder and curator for Dialogue City, a civic engagement program within the 2008 Democratic National Convention, as well as led projects with Oprah Winfrey's Harpo Studios, Microsoft and MySpace in the city of Liverpool, England. He also served as the interim chief design officer for the entire state of Rhode Island. As an undergrad at RSID, the Rhode Island School of Design, he helped launch the Office of Public Engagement, eventually serving as his founding director. While Seth shares many stories and ideas in this episode, we were particularly drawn to five big ideas of his. One, Seth will argue that curiosity is facing an extinction moment because we don't permit ourselves to ask the root questions, the deeper questions. Two, curiosity is not a passive action, nor is it a static state across one's life. Seth argues that curiosity has quite a complex life cycle as we mature and evolve. Similarly, he stands on the idea that you can't stand on the sidelines to simply identify with curiosity. You are always playing the game. Three, design and storytelling are the fundamental frameworks to create a massive public information reboot about our understanding of the human condition for Seth and team. Four, while it would be tempting to frame Seth and his team in terms of design consultancy, he actively sheds that traditional business terminology. In fact, he's allergic to the term consultancy and refuses not to take a position with each client's project. Five, Seth is always seeking those who will embrace decade scale transformations of both their own entity as well as the social system that they're part of. He sees his team as having the unique weaponry for that battle. But as we said, he inspires us to think about so much more. So sit back and enjoy our season two, episode eight conversation with Seth Goldenberg. Seth, good, good, good morning to you. How are you, friend? Good morning. Good to see you. It is it is awesome to see you, Ben. Dude, I have serious glasses envy. Uh, Occasionally, I'm bold enough to put on a pair that I'm really proud of, but I don't pull it off well. And I just, I, you just, I mean, one, you have aura anyway, but you also just have great game there. <laughs> um, hey, you, you, we're going to talk about your book in a second. And I'm going to, before starting with the title and what it all represents and how in the world in the midst of pandemic did you and your team do so many things. Um, but in the midst of the book, I'm going to start with a quote that I have highlighted and circled and gone back to, as I told you a couple of times. You talk about curiosity and here's the the quick liner. I'm wondering, what does this really mean to you? Because it's a perfectly expressed phrase, but I wonder like, what does it really, really mean? So here's your Mm -hmm. phrase. Curiosity is a verb for living rather than a noun to hold. A verb for living rather than a noun to hold. What does that really, really mean to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, well, thanks for having me on the uh, wander and wonder discussion. I mean, I think uh, it feels quite aligned to the title and the frame of your series in that uh, I think we often grammatically use the term curiosity as more of a kind of static state. I am curious. I feel curious. Um, Versus uh, I am in active behavior living curiously. Uh, For me, curiosity is 
not a noun or a proper noun or an identifier like I am a Yankees fan. It's not an identity as much as it is a way of saying, I love to celebrate sport in the Yankees comparison. So curiosity is not a passive behavior. You can't stand on the sidelines and identify with curiosity. You are always playing the game. And so for me, curiosity is a way of active living. You remind me of, uh, in that turn of phrase, uh, always playing. First of all, I just love that idea that you're always playing in the spirit of, or the energy of, the behavior of curiosity. It reminds me of the difference between a finite game and an infinite game. And, and this idea of curiosity being this like embodiment of being alive, not just a thing we surgically sort of take off the shelf and apply on occasion. Um, mm -hmm. Does it come easy to you? Like my gut tells me Seth was born to be curious and Seth mm -hmm. has made a powerful living and, and, and done great things because he is inherently, but I'm wondering like, does it, does it come natural or are you always kind of reloading and, and challenging yourself in, in that idea of ever living, ever acting? Yeah. I mean, I would say that uh, your instincts are probably quite quite spot on. Uh, you know, I, I I think somewhere between uh, Benjamin Buttons and I, we were both born in reverse, right? Um, but uh, I don't know how to be in the world without asking questions of it without challenging it, without actively using all of my senses to make sense of it. Uh, you know, I, I think that's partly a disposition of being an artist or a creative of some kind. Uh, I was raised by a school teacher and a philosopher. That never hurt. Um, but I also think that, you know, in all of our lives, there are different micro eras. And I think we should be able to listen to how curiosity gets expressed in different stages of our lives. It's not as though curiosity is only done by uh, putting nice smelling markers in our mouth through our entire 90 years. That might be how it's expressed in our infancy. Some of us would still like to eat the marker later on in life, but it's an easy example of there, like all life cycles, like, like the idea of like a supply chain life cycle, curiosity has quite a complex life cycle. And there are things that we do that are ways in which our instinctual or our professionally intentional curiosity shows up that does mature and evolve. And the same action that we once called curious may not be the same action and a new action may replace that one. But the through line is indeed curiosity. It just shows its face in new ways. I am really uh, intrigued um, in kind of the origin side of your own path. And, yeah. you know, you sit at the... <laughs> Me <too. laughs> right? Sort of you sit at the... Out, let me know. Yeah. yeah. Well, kind of sit, you know, at the dinner table with a, with a, a, a teacher and a philosopher and sort of just the daily way of being is sort of inside that conversation and, and also just doing chores and stuff. But I'm wondering, so let's talk about life cycle. So there is, and we'll, 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 uh, we'll, we'll not, we'll jump over the infant side and that, that, that colorful tasty marker. Take you to where, when you're a younger person, you know, elementary school, middle school, wherever that, wherever you go, how did you express curiosity as a really younger version where it wasn't obvious how it would mature, how it would play out professionally. Young Seth, 
sitting at home, young Seth wandering around. How did Seth get into curiosity? Uh, well, there were two primary narratives for my, uh, well, maybe three that kind of define my youth. One, uh, I grew up in the Adirondack Mountains in upstate New York in an extremely rural environment. And so I think um, while I spent most of my youth planning to get the hell out of there, the reality was, of course, as all things become clear in adulthood and in hindsight, raising a family and immersing in the playground of a six million acre Sherwood forest might help someone harness their curious sensibility, right? Um, having space, having time, having slow sounds, right? Uh, for me, for a long time, the size, the density, and the sounds of a city were intimidating and overwhelming because of a true rural upbringing. Uh, you know, the, the town I grew up in had less than 5,000 residents. And so to come to uh, Providence, Rhode Island, to attend Rhode Island School of Design, you know, at 175,000, it might as well have been uh, the heart of Shanghai or uh, Tokyo or something, right? So being in nature mm -hmm. as a young person really gave me uh, a landscape in which th truly the wander and wonder potential was a daily act. It was like breathing. And second, I was uh, a painter. I was an artist. Mm -hmm. uh, I still consider myself an artist. I don't actively paint in a formal uh, fashion, but I was uh, very blessed to have innate skills and talent. And by the age of 12, I was exhibiting my paintings in, in uh, galleries and uh, presenting my work in the public realm. And so as an artist and in particular, at that time, a bit of a traditional oil painter observing and making more realism uh, at that time. You have to literally commit an extraordinary amount of time to looking, to seeing. Mm. So I was raised a more traditional kind of pre-Bauhaus school of thinking in art and design where you know, draftsmanship, the basics of composition, representation, depth of field were all important. And so to make a painting, to make a portrait, I often focus on portraiture, you know, to see color, to represent an accurately uh, an image is an act of deep observation. And observation is a type of curiosity to look with intent to be actively practicing the art of seeing when I didn't even have the Willy Wonkas that you like. Uh, and then I would just say third, to give my parents, to your point, uh, you know, credit. I mean, my father was a deep comedian, a, a very much humor was the language of our family. Uh, and my mother, as a school teacher, of deep care and mentoring. And, you know, all of these are buzzwords and terms I think we all know and that um, the kind of work that you and I do and that we found each other through, uh, they are known practices. But I think um, for them to not just be like transactional, but to be true values so if you put the three narratives together, the values of my upbringing were nature, looking, listening, laughing, and caretaking. I mean, of course I'm curious. I, I had no choice. You know what I mean? Well, in that, and, and I'm going to lean towards the caring side of things first, to be in an environment where you your native instincts or sensibilities, wondering, whatever it might be, as a child, as a young person, 
mm. are attended to. And within that, um, the ethic of care and the ethic of questioning, the ethic of laughter, like just if we just center that and think mm-hmm. if we simply created the conditions for people to feel any variation of those combinations, you're right. You had a you had a really kind of how could you have been otherwise? Um, mm-hmm. And and I appreciate when I want to go into this um, later in our conversation, too, that a lot of these expressions, whether it's in a branding marketing kind of the North Star of one's organization or kind of movement, we often anchor them in these kinds of words, right? Curiosity is the 21st century skill or something like that, right? But mm-hmm. it, it lacks a certain soul or a certain ethic mm-hmm. or a craft or a depth or whatever density, as you said earlier, about nature. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and But to feel those things and then to go out into the world. So would love to have you kind of take us a little further into out of the world. You mentioned you were RISD and you, as, as a young person, you know, the medium of painting and being an artist, kind of the craft of art. And that, mm. that's, I don't mean that in this superficial way. Mm. You go to RISD and you hinted that, you know, Providence, while not a massive city, may as well, though, have been as big as you could have imagined at that point. And you go to RISD, highly competitive, highly technical, but also, and I don't know if you're aware of this at 18, you clearly are now, also the kind of environment where people are challenging a lot of those structures and mediums and motifs and a lot of what design, uh, we know it as, as a, as a real human skill has sort of grown out of that. What, what did being at RISD do for you or what did it inform um, you as a young creative, as a young artist, as a younger emergent adult? Hmm. Yeah, so I had I had a very strange experience at RISD. I'm I'm not sure that um, my visit fits the kind of icon of what an arts education is. Uh, I mean, I like how you're saying, you know, I may or may not have been aware of it at 18, but RISD or an art school is, you know, a culture of challenging, right? So I would, I would, I would challenge the challenge. So I think I happen to have been at RISD at a time where it was not challenging. Hmm. The normative kinds of uh, cultural practices. You know, I think RISD, like most art and design schools, or just in my opinion, higher education in general, it has cycles of a kind of pedagogical or ideological culture. And I think most of art and design schools are constantly in threat of being spaces for mechanical aestheticians of being a kind of factory and production house of learning the technical and mechanical activity of making objects. And that feels very, um, very dangerous to me. And so actually my experience was to challenge even the thesis of what is a creativity education? My uh, hopes or imagination of, you know, the Mohawk wearing revolutionary troublemakers were rare to be found in the time that I was there, uh, which was kind of disappointing actually, right? Uh, at, a, at about midway through my schooling, I had a true like crisis of faith and I told my parents I was going to leave RISD because it was not meant for me. Uh, I was certain that the only place I could go was the Jack Kerouac School for Disembodied Poets, founded by Allen Ginsberg, of which they nearly fainted. Uh, and I settled for the second option, which was 
to meet with the dean of RISD and have a very open conversation about what made sense for my future. This is me as a, basically a sophomore. As a painting major, I found the work of actually painting truly more than full time, you know, some extraordinary hundred hour a week schedule to be very isolating. You get a small mm -hmm. studio and you sit alone. And my joke is the spiritual faith of Jackson Pollock will hit you and out of your own guts and mind, you will make spellbounding work. And once a week or so, you will share it and have a crit and get feedback from your peers and your professor. And then you'll do it again every week for three or four years. I am a very political, activist, social, collaborative being. And that isolation was hmm. squashing my sense of curiosity. So the result, without boring you or your listeners, was that I worked out essentially a deal with um, the leadership to prototype a new kind of degree path, a new kind of curriculum mm -hmm. that was about the role of an artist and a designer in public life. The whole world of collaborative public artwork, of participatory design, of making creativity a source of citizenship and activism and social impact was on the rise. It was being coded inside of the school environment as service learning, kind of. But in the art world, this was much more radical. We had artists such as Suzanne Lacey, uh, who wrote the book called New Genre Public Art, chronicling hundreds of new makers who did not retreat into their studio, but worked in collaboration with micro publics and communities to make change in the theater of public life. And so I prototyped a new kind of program and kind of got a pass from the traditional uh, course expectation. And I invented a new program called Catalyst Arts. And the day that I graduated, I was hired to run my thesis project and create a new institute called uh, the Center for Public Engagement at RISD. And we operated projects and courses and initiatives in neighboring communities across Rhode Island using every medium from painting to graphic design to sculpture. And we worked in collaboration with high schools and after school clubs and boys and girls clubs and um, you know public housing. And we built this network of public theaters to use the arts as a form of social action. And that's how I uh, found a way to complete my RISD experience by challenging the very presumption that oil paint is the only medium to make meaningful work. Trying to imagine, um, yeah, and, and first of all, I love that moment. <laughs> like option one, mom and dad, is, you know, I'm eventually going to throw it all away. I'm going to, you know, sort of wander as a beatnik poet in, you know, the 80s or the 90s, whatever it was at that time for you. Um, mm -hmm. But option two was to have a meeting with the dean. So you have to knock on that door, right? You have to uh, pre-email, I'm guessing, at that moment, or maybe email <laughs> wasn't the obvious. And you set up the meeting or... Maybe we're challenged to, by your parents to set up a meeting, but you went to a meeting and I, I have to imagine what becomes inevitable and what becomes a catalyst for the rest of your career and who you are now wasn't obvious in that meeting. And so I'm imagining a couple different elements if we were going to write the play, but we didn't know you. <laughs> Can you fill in the blanks? So were you were you being punk rock and like petulant and like kind of F you, but doing it thoughtfully? Were you like, I just need a mentor. Can you show me a reason why this can work? Were you already heightened to a particular kind of public performative, do good, do better, 
what, what was really going on in that 20 minutes or hour and a half? Yeah. And, and was that Dean unique in her or his sensibility where they saw enormous energy and capability and the potential of, again, not ego and, and finished, you know, proof of concept, but like what was really going on in that conversation that allowed sure. that to take place? That's a lovely question. I, I love the way you frame it too. Uh, I mean, I would say that if we were typecasting uh, for the the Broadway musical, um, you know, I I played a, a a significant amount of leadership roles very young in my life. Um, just to go back in order to go forward. Uh, when I was in high school, I traveled to Israel uh, when I was 16, and I uh, indirectly uh, experienced some of the uh, war and terrorism unfolding in Israel. And I kind of, you know, sometimes I talk about it by saying I left my small town at, as a 16-year-old and I came back, you know, a 60-year-old, hence the Benjamin Buttons reference. Uh, I, I grew up real quick. Um, you know, I had a kind of nearly PTSD kind of uh, uh, diagnosis after the uh, experience. I traveled for about 10 weeks across the country. And one of my outlets to um, constructively... Uh, both heal and make sense of those experiences was I, because I felt older and, you know, I was quite advanced uh, in my c capability already. I was much more attracted to spending time with adults than my peers. Okay. And so I began to serve on like the local school board became a fascinating environment for me rather than, you know, like my peers were wondering what the first color of their car might be as a 16, 17 year old. And I, I kind of felt there was a kind of crisis of meaning where I became attracted to the more complex challenges that adults and leaders were faced with. Mm. And so I learned to be a kind of public diplomat quite early. Uh, speaking, doing a lot of public speaking as a 17 and 18 year old, long before attending RISD. Um, you know, my school faced a kind of copycat Columbine shooter situation mm -hmm. in which I played a role in kind of shepherding the student community as this kind of like somewhere between like school government and these extra leadership layers that I was uh, invited into. So I had a lot of experience in kind of crisis management or being familiar with what a superintendent has to do to lead many stakeholders in complex systems. So I think that meeting with the dean was like, you know, he didn't really know what he was getting into because he invited a senator into his room and he thought he was a, it was a sophomore. Um, so I think I presented a solution in which every stakeholder could win. Mm. So, and that, that has been in some ways a kind of also through line to my work. I love how you yeah. uh, framed that up. If you imagine an alternate scenario than the current state. And in the design of that scenario, mm -hmm. each stakeholder that has interest can advance to a better state. It is illogical for most people to prevent it from at least a pilot experiment. Right. Well, I think I proposed and presented a solution that also enabled the school's interest to move forward. Mm. I remember doing research to present that because service learning was on the rise at that time, 
I literally brought in documentation to show here are the grants the school would be eligible for wow. okay. that they would not be eligible for because these are foundations that are currently prioritizing service learning and our school does not have a service learning arm or program. And so we are ineligible for these philanthropic funds. Don't you think, Dean, if you enabled me to try this out, it would position the school for hundreds of thousands of dollars of new resources. Just saying. I, 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 well, I'm, I'm so glad I asked. Um, and I really appreciate that you did go back and sort of recapture some of the context, some of what you were doing. It would have been compelling to think of a 12-year-old possessing enough technical skill and enough support, whether it be a gallery that took a shot at you or your ability to create enough body of work to show. That would have been an interesting through line to getting to RISD, right? One of the most competitive schools in this country, obviously in terms of the arts world, design world, one of the preeminent, right? And to go there. And it would have been a, a natural assumption that you're curious and intelligent and a little bit feisty and therefore I don't like the isolation and this and this, and just please, and a, and a nice mensch of a human being sort of saying, all right, you know, kind of slow row you a little bit. But then when you, when you talked about it, uh, it's almost like for me, the art, the, the, the craft and art and design side, I almost, for the first time since knowing you for a number of years, I almost for the first time find myself putting that over to the side. And secondarily, the kind of the more recent application and maybe saturation of human centered design methods, tools, post-it notes that every entity and industry sort of uses as a you know generic starting point now or ending point, whatever. And I put that aside. And what I'm finding really fascinating is that as you describe yourself, you had an instinct and an awareness of the power of finding a solution that would serve all. Not mm -hmm. necessarily there is a solution, how do I convince them? Although you probably have that skill set, but that the way forward is to create the possibility for all to go forward. And not just as an altruistic, nice to have, and I'm, you know, as you said, I'm socialist, so therefore there's for the betterment of all, for the betterment, of whatever. But like there's the chessboard of negotiation, the ability to, to be in a meeting, the ability as a young person to present as the elder Benjamin Button, classic, by the way, for you to reference uh, so naturally. Um, looking back on you, is, is, is that the core kind of OS of Seth is like the ability to very quickly discern who the people are that are assembling or even aren't even at the table, what will they need to go forward and how do we create the conditions for that? Is that at the heart of the work and the doing for you? Uh, I, I think it's a characteristic or a okay. condition. I'm not sure that it's the central OS. Okay. Um, I think for me, maybe part of the answer or the response to this thread is that it's maybe link to my point about curiosity having a life cycle, gotcha. right? So like if we use your metaphor of the chessboard, right? Um, you know, there's the old, like, it's like different, like 101 versus 202, like, sure, play the player, not the board, like good guiding principle, poker or chess, right? Um, but then there are questions of like, well, why is the board so small? Can we expand the perimeter of play? So I, I would say that um, it's not so much that I only exist to ensure that all stakeholders find and create value, although that is a technique and a process that we have found great success in our studio, in our practice. I don't think it's the objective, though. I think as I've gotten older and had more success, it has brought me a sense of confidence mm. that we should be asking harder questions about the assumptions that are constricting success or how we are even defining success 
because in a weird way, I mean, just like the game of life, if you will, while it is difficult to make all stakeholders happy and satisfied and evolving towards, you know, a shared objective, that is a worthy cause and assignment, if you will. If you're good at it, it's actually not that hard. Hmm. If you're willing to commit to multi-stakeholder interests and really discovered discover the shared values and the shared value, if that's the modus apparatus, it's actually not that hard. What's hard is to peel back the layers of the onion to challenge, is this what really will satisfy us? Is it more money? Is it more students at RISD? Is it more at all? So I think as I, my point about life cycle is I'm more interested today in challenging the assumptions of the whole damn game <laughs> rather than just make sure everyone passes go on the monopoly so we all get paid and we're all just moving through the motions. It's no longer enough to remove friction. Mm. It's more important to make all of us just a little bit uncomfortable, if not a lot, to question, uh, is Monopoly the game we want to play? Thank you for, um, th first of all, thank you for not the challenge, but the clarification for certain. Um, yeah. And really appreciated that even if my wondering was not quite centered, it, I really, I really, uh, I'm struck by that idea of like, whatever that metaphorical board is, the sort of mm -hmm. policies or the dynamics or the rituals we have, even the way we name ourselves and who we are and what we're trying to do, that sometimes we can, well, maybe most of the time we, we aren't even paying attention to the board itself. We're getting caught up in fr friction. We're getting caught up in price point. We're getting caught up in whatever, but to actually look at that landscape itself and wonder. So I, I, there's three things, three areas I would love to explore with you in, in the time that we still have together. Yeah. Um, on the back end, I want to focus on your book, uh, Radical Curiosity. So I want to, I want to save some time um, to hear you talk about what the book is, what it, the process and what it is making possible now. Um, yeah. Before that, I w would love to hear about the sort of array of entities that you help lead, you've created, you're an entrepreneur, you've got, you know, sort of an ecosystem of, of organizations and, and, and areas where you work with folks. So I want to get to that. But right before that, I want, I want you to drop yourself into kind of a day one moment with a community or a client. And you, you is, you know, as the frayed epic decade, which you help bring to life this idea that it's this we aren't going to sort of solve or make sense of it within a single business cycle or quarter. We're going to need time, right? You talked earlier about slow sound and density of space and the depth of time. So it makes sense having heard that now. But there's always sort of a day one or a day 1.A or 1.B where you're with that client, with that community, with that board, with that crazy network of folks who show up. Would you hint a little bit about what you do to people at that beginning that sets up provocation, sets up curiosity, sets up a willingness to not get stuck in the, like the immediacy. What mm -hmm. happens on a day one in an event you run, a project you launch, uh, an endeavor that has to go to ocean, so to speak? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I love that. And there's probably a good transition from our uh, chessboard metaphor and even the link to the book. I mean, one of the things I'll just name to get to the space you're opening up is it's called radical curiosity, you know, not on accident. It's, it's not your everyday breed of curiosity. <laughs> radical curiosity is something quite specific. So radical comes from the Latin word radicalis, 
which really means roots, the roots of things. So the, this is important to me in that the roots of things are what we should be curious about. Hmm. So my earlier joke of, ooh, look, a smelly marker. Let me put it in my mouth. I mean, there's a kind of absent-minded curiosity, which is just a kind of um, scratch and sniff making sense of the world that is less intentional. What radical curiosity as a kind of root issue comes really in large part from my influence from my father and that the kind of philosopher's operating system that was instilled in me. And I think that I believe that very deep questioning that gets to the very root of what we think some of the most basic building blocks of the human condition are. Like we used to have a kind of signifier in our companies where we say, how will we live, learn, work, play, and sustain ourselves over the next century? Like the kind of Maslow's hierarchy of needs kind of questions. Those are worth waking up in the morning for. Uh, and I think this shows up for me in your question of like, when we first begin a project, a program, an inquiry, often people frame for us what they believe the brief is. Mm -hmm. And the brief is often a problem and thus a solution. I mean, if you think about it, in the design field, they've already defined the solution. We need a website. Can you design us a website? Well, how do we know you need a website? Hmm. Well, our problem is nobody knows what we do. Okay, so you've identified the problem and you know the solution and you'd like to engage us as makers to fulfill that solution. Well, that's the part of RISD that scares me half to death. <laughs> so what we often do is we say, well, we should work together to rewrite the brief mm -hmm. and help you problem frame and even investigate the assumptions that went into framing what you believe the problem even is. It's very difficult for people who are swimming in the water of the fish tank to self-diagnose yeah. the problem with the fish tank. So we often say, well, let's get to the radicalis roots of things. Why do you want people to know about you? <laughs> Do, do you know about you? I mean, we begin very upstream and often the net result is we try to only work on projects in which the very essence of the purpose of the entity or the community or the endeavor is up for grabs. Otherwise, we're just moving the chairs on the Titanic, right? And that's a very difficult dance of trust to yeah. be granted, to have the access, especially with the caliber and scale of the organizations we've been blessed to work with. But I only want to work on the question of what's the point? Otherwise, what's the point? Okay. Um, I have known you for a stretch. And so in some way, none of this is surprising to me, but hearing it thoughtful, like having the chance to just ask you. And, and, and so here's, first of all, the phrase, the sort of idea of a dance of trust. And on one level, there's this humility and recognition of the, the caliber of those you work with, 
whether you're serving, whether they've reached out to you, whatever that assembly is. And you can't get there if that trust doesn't exist. And that easily attaches back to you as a young person, a young emergent adult, your ability to almost foster uh, you even called yourself a diplomat earlier and a senator at one point in time. And so there's that sort of ability to do that. And but also this like without apology, if we're not focused on what's the point, then dot, 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 what's the point? And so those two things are for me as first time hearing either from you. Mm -hmm. They align really nicely with everything I've known about you, but I really walk mm -hmm. away pondering those two things and wrestling with those two things. So would you talk a little bit about the sort of um, the portfolio or ecosystem or array of entities uh, for those, yeah. you know, we'll obviously share some links. Um, so this is just gives you a chance to kind of explore that landscape. But you have a bookstore, you have a design consultancy, you make things, you gather folks together to explore wicked questions and opportunities and what's the point of the point um, and, 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 and other things as well. Would you just describe, like if somebody says, hey, Seth, what do you do? You know, yeah. that kind of first <laughs> conversation. How do you describe what you yeah. do and what sits at the center of it? And how does somebody get into a collaboration or mischief making with you and your team? Who is your team? Like take us anywhere in that space. Yeah. Well, well, one thing also, again, as a, as a maybe a bridge from the last discussion is I, I like that you re-underlined the notion of trust and what it takes to do the what is the point kind of work. I would say that one of the things that differentiates the methodology and the kind of position we take is that we even take a position. So what do I mean by that? Again, this is like the kind of um, I didn't I didn't necessarily wake up this morning and tend to uh, you know knock the legs out of my alma mater, but you know the the joke of like RISD as a kind of technician aesthetic school versus you know like can you make a website? Well, of course we can make a website. Why do it at all? That pathology. Even the term, and you said it, and I accept that you said it because you're uh, you're a Yoda Jedi Knight, and you set me up perfectly to give you a great answer. But uh, I am allergic of the term to the term consultancy because, in my experience, ninety nine percent of the world of consultancy exists agnostic of a point of view. So what do I mean by this? Again, I'll wrap it back into some of the better parts of RISD actually. Um, you know, I began as an artist, I became a designer. In my field and in my world, one of the best ways I've come to think about this, and this is not the only way of course, but artists make and they give birth to this beautiful thing. And they just say, this has to happen. And I need to bring this into the world. And I hope someone in the world appreciates it and may encounter it and maybe value it enough that they might buy it or live with it or collect it or honor it in some way. That is what I would call a push momentum. I am pushing out from me a creative act that I believe I need to share with the world. One of the reasons most artists have the identity of being, you know, poor, starving artists is because they believe they should birth those ideas out in the world, whether there is a market for it or not. It's like a calling versus a designer a designer more often than not has a pull relationship to the marketplace, meaning a client offers a brief and I only begin my creative act in response to a problem that a customer has provided. me. I live in a hybrid of both of those. So I am interested in finding a brief, 
but I have a lot of opinions about what kind of beautiful act should be born into the world. So I retain authorship, hmm. even if I have on paper a traditional client, if you will. Right? So it's a both push and pull. And I share that when I say have a point of view, like obviously, I mean, look, the most cliche version is, uh, I mean, McKinsey doesn't wake up in the morning for less than half a million dollars to make a PowerPoint deck that is the same damn PowerPoint deck they've made for all 1,000 clients beforehand. There's a technician activity of business management consulting that feels as though it's simply about sharing information, sharing knowledge, which has its place, but it's about optimizing the operational success of an existing entity. You have X problem, you can call Accenture, you can call McKinsey, you could fill in the blank, Boston Consulting Group. They have blueprints to optimize what exists. I can do that, but I don't believe I am the best at that. And I think that most of the time, it actually doesn't help the question that most organizations are facing. The difference for me is that most of business consulting manages integers that already exist. What we do is we invent new integers. So what does that mean? When you hear the cliche, think outside the box. I think what most business consultants do is help you better manage the box efficiently, effectively, grow economics because of that, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. If I get a question, I say, I don't even where, know where the damn box is because the box is a dotted line perimeter based on a set of assumptions. So when I talked earlier about challenging the assumptions, challenging the brief, maybe the box is much bigger. Maybe there's no box at all. Maybe it's a Mobius strip. I don't know. But in order to actually dig deep enough, we have to invent new cultural models and new business models because all of business and part of what I say in radical curiosity is that all of society is facing an operating system reboot. So if everything's being rethought, what is health? What is learning? What is housing? What is food? Everywhere around us, we're rewriting the code of what all these things are. Well, that just says to me, if I believe that, that the question is not an issue of efficiency. The question is, well, what might it mean to invent health in the next decade or century? Mm -hmm. Is an authorship question, is a philosophical question, is a vision question, is a moral question? You used the word earlier, ethic. It is an ethics question, it is an equity question. We don't not know how to care for ourselves. Like, that's not, we're not like, well, I wonder if we can cut wait times down. There are people you can call for that. You don't call me for that, right? So it leads to your question, which I took a few minutes to tee up. We have reorganized our business around a now parent group called Curiosity & Co., we have gone all in on curiosity. We believe it is even beyond design thinking, which we are often you know, compared to, that curiosity guides all of our method. And you asked before, we have biologists on staff. We have anthropologists on staff. We have educators on staff. We have hospitality experts on staff. We actually have very few designers, ironically. Everyone is a design mind, 
But the specialties that we've kind of concocted in this ensemble cast is radically interdisciplinary because our work is cultural change. Our work is business model innovation. And our work is to work far into the future, hence epic decade, right, to your point. So Curiosity & Co. is now our kind of organizing device because it is what our core belief system is. Inside Curiosity & Co., the oldest entity, which is how you and I met, is called Epic Decade. And it's a kind of design studio that develops cultural change and business models with partners, clients, allies, cohorts. Uh, we have traditional, you know, money is exchanged. There's uh, social and business contracts. But we say up front to people, we're not going to not have a point of view. If we need to, we'll tell you when your baby's ugly, right? Like, it's just like, just so you know, we're wartime consigliaries. So we back horses we believe in. But if the horse is headed the wrong way, we're going to tell you, right? Now, Epic Decade comes out of a variety of pre-steps along my path that was most, in some ways, uh, imprinted on while I was at Bruce Mao Design. And to your point, when you say, what do you do? Or, you know, how do you introduce yourself? You know, my mother, who hopefully will listen to this podcast, still doesn't understand what I do. It was a great day when I sent her a copy of my business card when I joined Bruce. And my title was Vice President of Bruce Mao Design and Executive Director of Massive Change. She's like, what the heck is Massive Change, right? I mean, we're, but we're in the massive change business, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I joined Bruce when Bruce was moving from a creative services design studio into a true design thinking and cultural change agenda entity in some ways catalyzed by the book and the exhibit map, massive change. But I, you know, I talk about, you know, I gained seven PhDs in six months hanging with Bruce. And I started Epic Decade because to put a flag in the sand to say, we need to, as you so beautifully teed up, we need to not be consumed by the daily ticker tape. We wanted to put a signal out to the world that if there is anyone who wants to work on decade scale transformations, of both their entity, but more importantly, the social systems that they're mm. a part of, then we're available with unique weaponry for that battle. And that's what we've been doing really for the past 12 years. And as you suggest, and I'll, I know I've been talking a little bit, so I'll pause here, but we have found that even in the most radicalized consultancy or anti-consultancy there are limits to that toolbox. And so there are a variety of mm -hmm. rocket ships that you can commandeer with that same agenda. So we say, great, um, let's make a community center. So we create an excuse to have a bookstore, wine bar, event center in our own community because that has become a place to do the same work. Mm. You think you're going in to buy a book. We're really introducing you to new narratives about what the future could look like. I mean, it is an experience lab inviting you into curiosity. The store happens to be called literally the curiosity store. We now have uh, a new agriculture uh, and future of living systems business that we've been developing. We're very concerned about uh, how climate change will affect how we grow and caretake our experience of food and the health of nourishment. So we have started ventures that are not dependent on traditional clients that are just, this goes back to my art versus design where we say, I know what should happen in the world. Let's just yeah. figure out a way to incubate it and start it. So in some ways, Curiosity Co has become its own venture incubator lab mm where we're having five, six, seven new entities with the same belief system kind of go at that 
moonshot goal through a variety of different languages, store, publishing outlet, food, all these different kind of techniques. Hopefully that wasn't too long. It's answer. brilliant. No, no, no. It's just, well, it's not too long, not too short. It's exactly, that was, that was like, that was Goldilocks just kind of being like, it was good, <laughs> good stuff. So I want to focus, um, you know, you and I don't have forever together in another 10 minutes or so. Yeah. Um, I definitely want to focus, um, you know, you talked to that. It isn't just a book about curiosity. It's radical curiosity. You talk about that's really tending to the roots, like really mm. peeling back and understanding like, why is this thing? And what is the question? And, and there's a very kind of, um, I almost imagine kind of a rabbi's approach, like or the five whys in the kind of workshop world. Like it's you ask a question to uncover the next question to keep, but it's always to tend to the roots. Like the thing that is um, if for intellectuals, it feels very Aristotelian, like it's sort of like the essence of the thing. Right. And for people to really understand, to be thoughtful and, and empathetic, it's like if I can understand the deeper why, then I can help you. But also, like, I want to know what I'm not going to waste my time on. Like, I, it's all this re- sifting. But you have written a book. So you we, we've heard about this thing called COVID, this kind of temporary, like just undoing of so many things, but also time to do things, right? And you wrote a book. And my understanding is your first book, you've curated things in book form, but it's your first, like Seth's first book. You also yeah. simultaneously began a printing press. And if I understand, in collaboration with a major uh, book publisher, and you are have a bookstore. And so if all we know about you, each of these things is a doorway in, a threshold into deeper work, mm-hmm. right? And deep, radical, uh, exploration and curiosity, but also book form is a very particular space. So there is this bookshop curiosity store where people can go in and quite literally buy a book, hear a, a, an author, engage ideas, really. So that classic, the, the heart of conversation, there is a book that you've put out into the world, radical mm-hmm. curiosity. It's meant to un- make uncomfortable and make clear in equal measure, I imagine. And you are going to be printing more books, right? So what, what is this pathway setting you and your colleagues up to explore or to make impact with? Um, where, where does this take us? If we just take those three elements. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, lo- I love the way you're um, kind of uh, dotting the constellation and the links. Um, so one of the threads that is a central through line of the book of radical curiosity that probably helps answer some of the other outlets is, you know, I, earlier I was describing that I believe that essentially all of society is going through an operating system reboot. And one of the ways I frame that is that I think that much of our cultural code, if you will, is imprinted upon us and living inside of the narratives that guide our identities and belief systems, that stories and storytelling, stories really uh, anchor and bring to life more abstract ideas. The stories we tell ourselves are the stories we become. And I think that part of that OS reboot is that there's a whole slew of legacy narratives that are slowly being killed off in a good way. Legacies that, and legacy narratives that really should have died long ago. Uh, But we are a complex species that doesn't let go of stories very easily. And there's a whole slew of new narratives that I call emerging narratives that are kind of on the horizon that are replacing or displacing those legacy narratives. It's almost like there's a flow where a narrative has a peak and then it slowly over time decays. And there's this crisscross moment where new emerging narratives that were minority storylines become major storylines and they kind of replace and displace one another. You could imagine applying this to very big 
ideas that are very meta, like gender or racism. Right? We see moments of friction around issues of gender or race. And we read a story, we read a news story when something has happened and we think of it very often situationally. Like, oh, this happened in this community, in this state. Oh my God, this tragedy. And it is, of course, a tragedy. However, for me, when I read these stories, I think of them as what I like to call an upending indicator. It's like a signal that the narrative on that issue is shifting momentum. Mm. So um, it often will take many decades for such a fundamental, essential narrative to have ups or downs in our public life. I mean, think about it. I mean, I, I bring this up in the book. Imagine that our grandparents, you know, I don't know how old your grandparents are, but, you know, my, my grandparents were born, you know, like a century ago. And for them, there were boys and there were girls. The idea that Facebook has nearly 100 different gender and sexual identifiers is so out of their narrative. It is so much in conflict with a legacy narrative that they have had repeated and messaged to them every day in every facet of their life for decades and decades that this emerging narrative of this whole other space is like the difference between like what we might jokingly say, like, do you have Yosemite or Mojave as your operating system on your computer? Like it's a public imagination reboot to rescope our understanding of the human condition. So to write a book and to start a imprint with Penguin Random House, to have a bookstore to reassert that we are as a collective nation actively writing the next chapter mm. okay. of what stories come next is like covertly the greatest project of our time. I mean, you can go protest, you can go meet the people and uh, be allies of the people. That's one form of actively co-authoring what we want our national narrative to be. Another literally is to write the narrative, mm. to use books, storytelling, thought leadership to build literally the next canon. Right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to try, I'm going to, I want to do two things. I want to kind of bring the conversation to a close and target it around this field of education, which I spend Great. the majority of my time and you're well aware of, and, and, and it just is a no brainer, but I also want to make people curious. Uh, so when they pick up the book, when they, you know, watch the talks you've given, when they double back on this, um, one, the book is wonderful on many fronts, um, because I think it is incredibly accessible. So like for you to be provocative and accessible is a nice balance. It is easy layer one to go. This makes sense. This makes sense. Oh, that's comfortable. Oh, I could underline that. I could borrow that. And then there's another level, um, which good books start at, and yours is one of them, where you read it and you realize, no, I need to wrestle with this a little bit before. But towards the very end, you you offer a series of things to actually do, like great ideas, great provocation, great questions, great case studies, but here's some things. And I just love that some of them, I, I love this idea of trust walking, quite literally the act of being on a walk with another being and creating the conditions for that conversation to be a space 
worthy of them, right? I just love the idea, listening to slow time, like some really wonderful things that are sort of really obvious on the surface, but then kind of piss me off because they require them like, oh, what does that really mean if you go do it? Or, you know, you don't just hold on to it. But let me, let me ask you about this book. I look at this book as somebody who works with a lot of school leaders, school leadership teams, boards, uh, work with a lot of designers helping to sort of help foster the future of learning, whether it be technological or whether it be architectural or whether it be culture, uh, curricular, et cetera. And, and as you have said earlier, like, I don't know the exact phrase, but what I'm remembering is to say all bets are off. The very, these very legacy narratives of entire systems, entire, entire like sectors of human doingness. So education's yeah. a pretty obvious one, right? And one narrative could be, it's all going to pot. And you may as well just decide when to jump off the edge of the boat and swim for some distant island and decide what your backstroke is in the wild choppy waters. Another version is like, we cannot lose this because if we lose this, we lose anything that resembles societal network and fabric and connection, right? That, And everybody's swept up in ChatGPT4 and will kids cheat? And what is this ChatGPT4? And should colleges matter? Will kids go to college? Should I be personalized as a learner? Should I be part of some larger conversation of social value? But I know one thing. This book will read really nicely in a lot of school leaders' offices. It will show up in some faculty meetings. It will be keynote worthy. It will be like one of those books, right? Mm -hmm. And and people will trust your judgment. I so they'll so. want to know what does Seth have to say. I also know it could very easily just become the book and then the next book comes and it was a moment where people kind of went, yeah, I get it. That's good stuff. And we're for curiosity too. And we'll add it to our theme for next year. I'm a university yeah, provost yeah, yeah. or I'm a K-12 principal. What do you want educators to really do with this if they take the time to hold it, to share it, to set up discourse? Like what should leaders of places called schools really do with this book because I want to share it with leaders far and wide, but I also don't want to take for granted what they should do with it. What do you want them to do with it? Hmm. That's a great, that's a great question. Uh, I love, <laughs> I love the, uh, the double dog dare nature inside of it. Um, you know, I, I just think that, um, you know, one of the, one of my favorite lines uh, that really actually in my first kind of meetings with uh, my publisher at Penguin Random House, I think really solidified that we should do this book is uh, that, that I believe and one of the kind of urgent like rays of the flags is that curiosity is facing an extinction event. Right. It, it could very well be, which is a, it's a strange and provocative frame, right? Because it's not like, you know, this bird goes extinct, right? But uh, something that is intangible could go extinct. Something so meaningful and powerful as curiosity. And I think that we are so busy and so distracted by the day-to-day -day tactics and transaction of just waiting to keep our head above the water that we don't permit ourselves to ask the root questions of like, just why? Why? Really? Like, why do we have education? Why do we, why has learning as an enterprise is one of the largest industries in the world that does not agree on its reason for existing? Why do we do it? Like what you just outlined it. Is it to contribute to society? Is it to get a better job? Is it to get you into college? Is Call, you know, all these, mm. we don't even know why we're doing it. It's a fascinating thing, right? I, by the way, I think this is a problem of every social system. Like people don't know what health really means. 
And is the healthcare system contributive to that as a central destination? So when, with that context in mind, when you say, well, what would I want education leaders to do with this? I, I would hope that this book in total, and there is a section on learning, but the book in total would provide a new, like, Batman utility belt, a new set of weapons of curiosity to put curiosity into practice, to go further upstream, to not interrogate, is this the right math curriculum or is this the right old school or digital chalkboard, but to say further upstream, what is our very premise of why we do this thing. Mm. And can we at least use our elbows to exert some space somewhere? Can we protect the space to at least have the conversation? It may not be that the results are tremendously different. I don't know. I have a suspicion, but I'm just devastated that it feels to me like we are not asking the deeper questions and there are few, not in a formality like this association, this professional association once a year has a seven hour conference, not in that pedestrian fashion, but as a leadership practice to question the very premise. I mean, I'll conclude with one example and I'd love for you to have the last word. I use this in the book. If you ask any general American about their experience with public education in this country, just do a basic survey. You're at a friend's house. You're at a neighborhood association. You're doing an informal survey. From one to 10, are we killing it? At a national scale, not, oh, this one school is an anomaly. My cousin had an extreme yeah. experience. At a national level, if you corner anyone and said, hey, are we killing it on American public education? I would put good money down that essentially no one is like, we got this. In fact, most people, when you get them talking, are the biggest critics of either their experience, their family's experience, or what they see as the national outcome. And yet, simultaneously, another social system will literally throw you in jail if you don't participate. So imagine this. This is what our nation at a systems level has designed. A multi-trillion dollar system that is not succeeding and a policing system that will punish you for not participating in an unsuccessful system. This is one, this is a design problem if I've ever heard one. Right? Or it is designed precisely as it was. Right. We, we know that there's also sort of a sarcastic, uh, uh, a wondering about that. Um, I, what I'm going to take away, so I'm just going to put the challenge back on, on, on my shoulders. I'm going to take away um, this idea of, of what does it mean to really um, uh, ponder, but, but explore the very premise. So I, I get, I get uh, purposefully, and, and I have a bias towards sort of this kind of future of X, call it education, which is more structural, learning, which is more of like the human endeavor. But on some level, it's the thing that, sh not the thing we have, the thing we should have. But even within that, I get swept up in solutions that I can already imagine. And, and even when I'm in a position of just offering feedback or facilitating or curating or, or provoking, there is a whole litany of elements. And so one of the things I want to take away from this conversation is to what degree am I really tending to the question beneath it? Um, and, and so thank you for that. And as I, you know, want to share 
the book and and access to so many of the things that you do. One of the things that that I'm so grateful this is recorded and not just a transcript and that people will have a chance to see you or hear you. And I think this comes across when people just lean into the thing they care deeply about. But if it was just the word, it would be easy to hear a strident, almost militancy, like even the, the language of weaponry could easily sort of in a wordle world could come across me like, wow, this guy's really, you know, pretty intense. But when you hear it in this, there is joy, there is, there's loving, there oh, yeah. is a sense of adventure in you. And the, there's a, there's a, there's a smile when you, when you sort of decide like, okay, I'm going to go. And I just, I realize having been in rooms you've guided and, and facilitated and hosted and having seen you do work where I'm just sort of more observant and then just listen, I realize that I'm always hearing that sense of joyfulness and, and a belief that the good is, we are on the midst yeah. of designing what is potentially good. And, and yeah. I, I just want to say to you, like, if it were just technique and methodology and just, you know, a portfolio of, of client case studies, it would be pretty yeah. remarkable, Seth, but it isn't where the good stuff is. And, and hearing you and spending an hour hearing and watching your face and getting a sense of tone and where the pauses are, it's like, no, this is, this is the good the good and the hard, and and I really value that. So, Seth, thank you for taking time and yeah. challenging me, who had a little bit of context, but it's like, oh, there's a whole bunch of new. Obviously, for others, we're excited. If there's their first time learning about you and your team's work and this kind of ecosystem of incredible things about Curiosity and Co., I'm excited for them, but there's all kinds of stuff in between. I'm, I'm wondering what people will, will take note of. So, thank you, and I wish you a great day ahead. Well, thank you for having me. It was a delight.